Welcome um, to Time to Get Serious About Irony. Uh, I'm Jacob Reynolds. I'm a postgraduate student at the University of Oxford, and I'm going to be chairing this session. So a little bit of context. I think we'll all admit that irony as a sort of cultural trope has proved itself fairly resilient. Over the last couple of decades, we've had no shortages of forecasts for the end of irony, but it thrives, and it still seems deeply embedded in culture. And, the most obvious examples being like hipsters knowingly supporting ridiculous moustaches, uh, increasing silliness of blockbuster movies that shield themselves in an ironic distance from the subject matter, and the rise and rise of stand-ups like Frankie Boyle who can get away with causing offence by saying that they don't really mean it, they're just sort of being ironic. Um, and the general pervasive feeling that all our important statements about values must be shrouded in quote marks. So is it time to take a stand against this cultural trope? Is it time to throw off the cloak of irony and really start meaning things again? Or is there something to be said for irony? Is it perhaps preferable to a, a false sense of moral and political certainty? And what might, or perhaps is, be coming after irony? So to discuss these questions and many others, I'm delighted to introduce you to a really fantastic panel. So furthest on my right, we have Julian Bagini. He's the founding editor of The Philosopher's Magazine, author, Welcome to Every Town, A Journey into the English Mind, and also, but more recently, The Ego Trick, and is a writer for numerous publications, including The Financial Times, Guardian, and Prospect. Speaking next will be Edward Docks. He's on my immediate left. He's a novelist, screenwriter, and associate editor of Prospect Magazine, for which he also writes. Then, on my immediate right, we have John Waters, who's a columnist at the Irish Times, the Irish Mail on Sunday, and the Irish Catholic and Traces. And he's the author of Feckers and Was It For This? Why Ireland Lost the Plot. Then speaking last is on my far left uh, is Dr. Tiffany Jenkins, who's a sociologist, cultural commentator, and has a, a, a column in The Scotsman. So without any more from me, I think it's time we'll kick things off. And I'll ask uh, Julian to give us his opening remarks, please. So I was flicking through a 1968 edition of Life magazine. And there was a review of La Chinoise, a film by Jean-Luc Godard. And it's about a group of students. It was made in 1967, a group of French students who become radicalised, followers of Mao, and basically get involved in trying to create revolution and end up um, in acts of terrorism. In the review, uh, the reviewer says, what always saves Goddard's work is his supreme sense of irony. Outsiders who fascinate Goddard are nonetheless absurd creatures. Uh, as he explains, adolescent inattention keeps undercutting revolutionary fervour, as in the sexual cross-currents that keep swirling about. And when these humourless idealists move from talk to action, things fall still further apart. Now, as I say, I haven't seen the film, but even without seeing it with those descriptions I think I get a little bit of a sense there of what irony can be what it should be what it shouldn't be but why you certainly can't do without it because as that sort of phrase shows the humorless idealists without irony without any sense of irony people sort of lack really any sense of the mismatch between aspirations our highest hopes for ourselves and the reality, because for whatever we may think, there is a mismatch between those things. Uh, time and again, we do show ourselves to be frail, corruptible, often somewhat pathetic, stupid, absurd creatures. And I don't think that's misanthropic to say so. I think it's just kind of true. If you simply re reject that humorless taking ourselves too seriously and end up putting everything in inverted commas, as it were, then that makes a sort of an opposite mistake. What you're doing there is you're not taking remotely seriously what should be taken seriously. Now, what I hope, you see, is that in someone like Goddard making a film is going to, through observing these ironies, not descend into that kind of, I think, completely negative form of irony which has become more pervasive, not to become so fixated on the ironies of the, the mismatch between our aspirations and the realities as to have lost all sense of the seriousness of the situation itself. The balancing act, really, is what I'm calling for here. The balancing act is to see that the absurdity of life is, in a sense, intimately connected with its seriousness. If there are no high ideals to distort or pervert, no good milk to sour, if you like, then the, the, the human story simply becomes one about a bunch of deluded fantasists. 
So I think there is a right kind of irony, is understanding that there is this comic mismatch between the problems of the world and our contribution to solving it, for example, but seeing that in order to live a good, honest life means accepting that and doing the best we can. And indeed, there is a sort of like an irony in the fact that if there is too, when it becomes too much, too ironic, in fact, the irony is lost. Because if you actually do reduce life to, uh, every, if everything becomes an in inverted commas, everything becomes trivial, then actually there is no real irony anymore. Because irony depends on there being, as I say, some kind of mismatch between the perception of reality, the aspiration of the reality. And if everything is inverted commas, there simply is no mismatch in the first place. Uh, there was a film which I thought did capture this film, a very good example of the what I think is the correct use of irony. I don't know if anyone's seen Lucas Moodison's film Together. This is a story of a failed 70s experiment in communal living and free love in Stockholm. Now, it'd be very, very easy to make a film like that in which was completely mocking both of the characters and of humanity in general. So say, oh, these foolish, silly idealists believed they could live by these high ideals and free love, and look how silly they were, end of story. And what I found actually really great about this film, really humane about it, was that it did indeed show the various ways in which uh, people were completely unable to live up to the high ideals they set themselves. But it never seemed to be poking fun at the aspirations themselves, at the ideals themselves. It always seemed to realise there was something of great importance there that needed to be done. So I think, you know, what I would commend is, is a kind of irony that is the one that you see in writers like Kierkegaard who think that irony is, is, is actually deeply connected with serious self-examination. In order to have a serious self-examination and examination of the world, you have to be aware of the sometimes comic and absurd ways in which we fail to mismatch, uh, match up to what we'd hope. But at the same time, if you give up on any such inspiration in the first place, you are kind of uh, lost. The challenge is neither to take ourselves too seriously nor the world too seriously, but nevertheless not to not take it seriously at all. I think in general, the sort of, if there's a formula, for, there isn't really a formula for that, but I think in general it's be, being capable of, I think, taking ourselves as individuals not too seriously, but taking the problems of the world very seriously uh, indeed. Now, I, di I did want to just say briefly how I think this theme is actually quite important to the project of something like this very weekend. I noticed that the, the slogan of the weekend is shaping the future through debate. Now, there is a risk with that kind of statement that it becomes an irony free. The, uh, there's, an, uh, there's a potential absence of irony there, which I think would be wrong, uh, mistaken, because I think we would be deluded if we really thought that by coming together this weekend we were going to change the world. Now, I don't think anyone really does think that. At the same time, it would be, I think, absurd if we were to decide there's no point in having serious debates anymore because nothing's going to change anything. That would be the opposite mistake. What we actually uh, want to do is to accept our, our limitations. And I do sometimes think that there is kind of a false sort of choice being presented to us uh, which uh, compels people to either choose between a kind of a, a naive sincerity or a kind of you know, nonchalant irony, which is, you know, the choice is not between thinking of human beings as perfectly free, rational, autonomous, autonomous beings in control of our values, desires and actions, or to see ourselves as being hapless victims of social, biological and neurological forces. Rather, we have to see ourselves as having certain capacities for rationality, freedom and autonomy, which are indeed being constantly undercut by things we're just completely unaware of in our environment, our biology, and so forth. And that often does lead to this somewhat comic, at times, uh, mismatch. But nonetheless, I think that the, the moral of the story is not to give up on trying to develop that rational side as much as possible. All we need to do is to, to bear in mind, always be aware of our limitations and have that appropriate sense of irony, so that we can be serious without taking ourselves too seriously. Thank you very much, uh, Julian. A uh, great way to kick things off. So I'm now going to ask Ed for his open remarks, so when you're ready. Wonderful to see you all. I had no idea irony was so popular. <laughs> I'm going to take on what has just been said, explain how I see irony, and, uh, and then also go on to just close with some remarks about how I think it's losing its grip. 
So um, for me, the first question is, what is irony? And the answer to this for me is that irony is actually postmodernism in civilian clothes. It's a dressed down, somewhat disingenuous barroom version of the great idea of the late 20th century. So a better question is, what is postmodernism? Well, in the beginning, postmodernism was not merely ironical, merely gesture, some kind of clever sham or spoiler, a hodgepodge for hodgepodgery's sake. Rather, in the beginning, it was a movement of great force that sought to break something, a force that required and then dispersed a great deal of energy, a force comprised of a new and radical permissiveness. It was a high-energy revolt, an attack, a strategy for destruction, a set of critical and rhetorical practices that sought to destabilise ideas like identity, historical progress and certainty. Above all, it was a way of thinking and making that sought to deprivilege one ethos and deny the consensus of taste. And like all the big ideas, it spilled over and colonized the social political as well. I think there's two main points. First, that postmodernism is really an attack not just on the dominant art forms, but rather an attack on the dominant social discourse. All art is philosophy and all philosophy is political. And the epistemic confrontation of postmodernism, this idea of deprivileging any one meaning, this ironization, this idea that discourses are all equally valid, has led to some real world gains for humankind. Because once you're in the business of challenging the dominant discourse, you're also in the business of giving hitherto marginalized or subordinate groups their voice. And you'd have to be from the depressingly religious right or otherwise peculiarly recondite not to believe, for example, that the politics of gender, race and sexuality have been immeasurably affected for the better by the assertion of those separate discourses. The second point, deeper still. In truth, postmodernism aimed further than merely calling for revaluation of power structures. It said that we are all, in our very selves, nothing more than the breathing aggregate of those structures. It contends that we can't stand apart from the demands and identities that those structures confer upon us and make judgments. Instead, it holds that we move through a series of uh, various coordinates on maps, class, gender, religious, sexual, ethnic, situational, and so on, and that these coordinates are our only identity. We're entirely constructed. So here we come to the question, why do, we th why do I think that postmodernism and its little brother irony are on their way out? Here's why. Let's go back to the arts. I think, artistically, that these ideas are receding. It doesn't mean that postmodernism's impact or its importance is diminished, not at all. We can't unlearn a great idea. But rather this, that postmodernism and irony are themselves being replaced as the dominant discourse of, and are now taking their place on the artistic and intellectual palette alongside all, all other great ideas and movements. In the same way as we are all a little Victorian at times, a little modernist, a little romantic, in the same way that we are all children of Aristotle and the great religious tracts of Kant and the Enlightenment, so we are all, and will forever be, children of postmodernism. All these movements subtly inform our imaginations and the way we discuss, create, react and interact. But more and more, postmodernism is becoming just one other of the colours we might use, or, to switch metaphor clumsily, just another tool in the artist's kit. Why? Well, I think because we're all becoming more comfortable with the idea of holding two irreconcilable ideas in our heads, that no system of meaning can have a monopoly of truth, but that we still have to render the truth through our own chosen system of meaning. So the postmodern challenge, while no less radical, seems somehow less powerful to us. We're learning to live with it. Perhaps the best way to explain the reason for this development is to illustrate what I might call a postmodern paradox. If we deprivilege all positions, as irony seeks to do, we can assert no position, and we cannot therefore participate in society or the collective, and so, in effect, an aggressive postmodernism or an aggressive ironic take becomes, in the real world, indistinguishable from a species of passive conservatism. In other words, nothing gets done. Looked at this way, it's easy to see why its power has diminished. The postmodern or ironic solution will no longer do as a response to the world we find ourselves. Yes, this is the age of the internet, but if we look behind and beyond that, we find a secondary reverse effect, what we might call a universal craving for some kind of offline authenticity. We desire to be redeemed from the grossness of our consumption and the sham of our attitudinizing. We want to become reacquainted with the spellbinding narrative of expertise. Bands now post videos of themselves to promote their music, yes, but also to prove they can actually play the guitar. If we tune in carefully, we can detect this growing desire all around us. 
We can see it in the specificity of the local food movement or the repeated use of the word proper on gastropub menus. We can hear it in the word legend as applied to anyone who has actually achieved anything in the real world. We can recognise it in advertising campaigns such as Jack Daniels. To be a rebel is now to be authentic. We can identify it in the way brands are trying to hold on to or take up an interest in ethics or in a particular ethos. A culture of care is newly advertised and celebrated and cherished. Rather than referencing values are important, the values that the artists put into the making of an object and the uh, values that the consumer takes out. Go deeper still and we can see a growing reverence and appreciation for the man or woman who can make well, people who can actually do things. We uncover a new emphasis on design through making, the reprivileging of craft skills. Gradually, gradually, we can hear more and more affirmation for those who can render expertly, the sculptor who can sculpt, the ceramicist, the jeweller, even the novelist who can actually write. These three ideas of specificity, of values, and of authenticity are at odds with postmodernism and irony. I think we're entering a new age, and let's call it the age of authenticism and see how we get on. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you very much, Ed. Um, so now moving on to John. So go for it. Mate. Thanks. Thanks, Jacob. Um, since the discussion on irony is probably completely inappropriate to start with a joke, so I'll do, I will. Um, a midget goes into a bookshop and uh, goes, approaches the, the counter and says to the assistant who's engrossed in something, do you have any books on irony? And the assistant, without looking up, says they're on the top shelf over there. <laughs> <laughs> This isn't this isn't an ironic joke. It's not about irony. It's more kind of, I suppose, pathos or slapstick or something. But my use of it is could be ironic in the sense that I use it in a in a certain ironic way, addressing you, the audience, as a representation of a culture. What's my objective? It's to test the water to see what kind of space I can generate for myself in your awareness or your receptivity towards me. So I can actually make more nudge more space out by creating an ambiguity about my intentions. Am I offensive or am I a parody in the idea of offence? Uh, am I, you know, being insulting to midgets or am I, in a sense, uh, identifying with midgets uh, against some unnamed vague uh, uh, enemy? Uh, and that's kind of what happens a lot in our culture now, where, where meaning is completely fractured. And the reason for that is that we actually, that's kind of the way we all increasingly are in the world, because it, that's the only way we can really kind of survive and negotiate culture. Uh, it's To me, it's about really the, the, the private, the personal, and the, the public. And the way I kind of, to give you a visual representation, it's really like a comic strip where you have a thought bubble as against uh, a speech bubble. Uh, and so more and more, we have to be increasingly Care, uh, conscious of the difference between what's in the thought bubble and this, the speech bubble, because that's because we have lived with 60 years or so of mass media, and more and more our entire kind of understanding of our public role is governed by a public consciousness, which we feel we have to be able to understand and not make fools of ourselves in and not offend and so on. I mean, every week in, in the UK you have. We have it in Ireland as well, uh, in different ways. But I mean, you know, football managers telling jokes and create, you know, wiping Syria off the the, the, the headlines and and uh, uh, that kind of thing. So you can't, you, 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 if you actually, you have, we are not allowed in a sense. We're not actually. I don't think yet. We haven't yet got to the stage of understanding that in fact each of us is fundamentally divided in culture in this way, and that more and more that thought bubble becomes quieter and quieter and, and more diminished. And it is in a certain sense being extinguished. So that the public self, the public expression is becoming the most, the dominant thing. And I think that's where irony is the instrument we use to kind of cross over, to kind of evolve between the two levels of our awareness and our giving back to the world. So, you know, and I, I think this has actually got to do with the fact that ideologies and uh, assumptions and prejudices now feed into our consciousness every moment. And we have to try and filter these and negotiate them and f take a position on them that won't get us into trouble. So we adapt a kind of a, a position which is ironic, so as to, in a sense, to create an ambiguity, to push an ambiguity ahead of us in order to avoid having to commit ourselves before we find out what the others think. Does the audience laugh? Did the audience hiss? Uh, does the person frown? Do they smile? Do they, can I feel in their handshake a, a, a kind of a reaction against me? And I think more and more we have to be ironic in the world.
So I don't think it's, uh, obviously it's not, it's no longer a literary device. It's no longer to do with wit necessarily. I mean, those, that's what it started as. An, an ironic person was a kind of a humor, a, vi a, a dryly humorous person. You know, it was, a, it was a device used by various writers in order to, affect, to achieve certain things. But now it actually is an organic element of our culture and a deeply necessary part. Why? Because we've actually, we are afraid of that thought bubble. We're afraid of the deep personal self. We're in fact, you know, increasingly, uh, uh, as uh, Julian's book and, and, and lots of other people have been talking about this idea, that is, they're trying to demolish the whole idea that there is a self at all, uh, that there were, there's this attempt to actually deconstruct the very idea, so that, in fact, there is no John Waters at all. It's a trick of, uh, you know, electricity in my brain. Uh, and, and more and more, we're moving towards that. I call that a kind of a, a, a metaphysical uh, anorexia, where man in that collective sense, is trying to diminish himself, but he doesn't know where to stop. He doesn't know what the, the end point will be, as far as he can, because he just keeps not eating. Now, there's a, a kind of a strange kind of set of symptoms of this. So one of them, ironically, is obesity, uh, you know, where people actually, having lost the internal sense of meaning, looking outside for the gratification which will satisfy the desire, which is, defines the self, uh, end up getting fat when their spirits are actually shrinking. Uh, and irony is another part of that, is part of that whole mix of, of emotions and weapons and instruments which we uh, have to find, you know, to deal with the modern world, to deal with the fact that even though we don't think about it, all our thoughts are being thought for us before we get to think them at all. And, and uh, so we actually have to react before we think. We have, react to everything. And, and everything then becomes like a statement, you know, of, and you just look at, you know, John Berger's uh, idea, the, the, the gnome, the garden gnome, you know, which started off, you know, as something naff, which is evidence of your totally grotesque bad taste. You know, you had it plopped there in the middle of your garden. And people look by and say, oh, you'd nearly vomit when you would see this. Uh, and the if you met the person, you would, you would avoid them. You would, you would, as if they had halitosis or something. And then, Overnight, almost, the, the garden gnome became ironic. So it no longer was something naff, some evidence of your poor taste. It was like a raised eyebrow to the passerby. And you, you suddenly became a very intelligent person. Even though you were the same person, you were the same person, and it was the same garden gnome. Uh, and, and this is happening all the time in our culture, you know, with all kinds of things. For example, Tom Jones, I think, years ago, uh, he went out of fashion, you know. And then Jonathan Ross had him on the last resort back in 88, I think it was. And overnight, jo Tom Jones be became reinvented as a new mo postmodern kind of idea, even though there's nothing change about his music, nothing changed about him. And this happens all the time, because why? Because we don't have any sense of fun, we're not permitted, we don't feel permitted to actually express a judgment. We don't ex feel ex uh, entitled to express a fundamental truth. And that's what I, what I mean by meta metaphysical anorexia, that we're actually shrinking the very idea that there is a core uh, meaning to our existence, uh, that everything, there is no such possibility of authenticity, there's no possibility of specificity, because what is to be specific about? What is to be uh, authentic about? So, and this is the dilemma we have. And of course, to finish, we have to be serious in a certain sense. And I, I completely ex accept Julian's position, like that, you know, you have to, you know, people who are serious are a pain in the ass. <laughs> really. But what's the alternative? This is the strange thing, that you cannot run a society without deeply serious people. Now, these people can be in their private lives ironic, but you can't run a society with irony. If you, if the Prime Minister starts to speak ironically, there's something seriously wrong. <laughs> uh, and, and, and it would be deeply disturbing given the present incumbent of that position. Uh, uh, so, we... We need to find a way around the corner of, this, of these things, you know, around the fat people and the ironic people to some kind of future highway that will lead us to, to, to uh, I won't say uh, uh, eternity, but somewhere useful. Thank you, John. And then Tiffany. Thank you. A couple of weeks ago, there was a programme on irony on Radio 4 in which Armando Nucci, the Glaswegian comic, gave quite a nice description of what it is that I want to begin with. Irony, he said, is about recognising a second voice which is not your own and thinking it might be just as valid. And I want to keep that in mind throughout my talk. So it's the opposite of a drunk voice, the voice that we hear with absolute certainty when we're drunk, either an morose drunk or a happy drunk, but we are absolutely certain that our, you, know, you are our best friend, that what we're doing is right and meaningful at the time. It's shown itself irony in various historical stages in the 1500s and the 1800s, and most recently in the last 20, 30 years, where it's been at its height and a kind of cultural trope, and quite productively, I think, in literature and architecture and in culture to a point. 
Um, it's been very funny and creative. So looking at it in this manifestation, I think it would appear to, at, at first glance, be somewhat exhausted. But I think actually what's happened, it's just become very aware of itself. And there's something about irony which does breed, because of the suspicion, it does breed a kind of a search for authenticity. And I think actually that's really what you're seeing, a product of irony. So my first point is that it's certainly not over. It's an attitude that pervades our thought and behaviour. And the deep root, really, of contemporary irony is in our sense of self. It's whether we can trust ourselves, then relationships with each other and institutions. Ultimately, that distrust lends itself to a refusal to see feelings, ideas, or projects through, because that second inner voice is constantly kind of trying to trip us up and ask us, really, do we really mean it? Do we want to go there? You might be caught out. We might be made suckers. And that's the worst thing of all. So constantly, we qualify, we joke, we play. It's playful, but it's very, very problematic. It's a marker of our apparent worldliness and maturity, but it's one that ends up with us refusing to take a position and ultimately refusing to take any sort of responsibility. In my mind, that second voice is very loud, if not louder, and it's ultimately highly conservative because it basically refuses to shape culture, refuses to shape politics, and it refuses to engage. So it is ultimately highly conservative. We can see its manifestation in many examples in contemporary culture, our inability to be serious. I mean, it is absolutely impossible to be serious today, to take a position with that qualification and to be committed and believe in something. The art sphere is a good example. This week and last week, we've got the wreath lectures from Grayson Perry. Now, he isn't a sculptor that's venerated because he's a sculptor. He is a sculptor because he, he's venerated because he kind of takes a mocking, wry look at contemporary culture. The interesting thing about Perry, of course, I think, is that he's actually very serious. If you kind of unpick what he says, it's, it's got some very interesting things in it, but he himself is unable to see them through. Um, he cannot take them any further. And in the cultural sphere, again, you, you have a reluctance at best, dressed up um, in kind of cosy relativism, to ever say anything is any good or not. I mean, Will Gomps, the arts editor for the BBC, was on Start the Week recently with a new, pro with a new book about modern art. And this is a guy that's worked with the tape for 10 years. He knows his stuff. And one of the contributors asked him, but is there anything good or bad in modern art? what can you tell us about it in terms of what you actually think? And he said, well, I'm not here to tell you what I think. And this is the arts editor of the BBC. So there's a refusal to engage. And what instead people do is talk about subtext and context. Um, John Berg is a very good example. Ways of, ways of seeing, I think, has decimated the academy, decimated the way in which we look at art, because all we're asking now is who did it and why, not what does it mean? I think that it does affect the political sphere. In fact, I think it probably stems from the political sphere, the kind of domination of irony. The second voice dominates. I was going to talk as a kind of counter today to irony, talk about hope. But as soon as I... You laugh, because as soon as I thought about hope, I thought about Barack Obama and his kind of rhetoric of hope and change and just how hollow and shallow it is. So I'm not saying it's an easy thing to do to be serious. But I think that second voice has kind of had major consequences. Had major consequences in a failure to shape culture, to move it on, to do something different, and also the political sphere. Now, this may not be Buffy the Vampire Slayer, but I think of two important movements recently, the Arab Spring and Occupy, and both failed to clarify their aims. Both failed to really win a manifest, to write a manifesto and win people over. And I think they didn't take the leadership that they needed. And that's when you have the army coming in or you're having something like, you have something like Occupy Dissolve. Because actually, no privileging does mean something is privileged. It's a con. There is no such thing as everybody is equal in irony. One person is, but we never really get to see them. And we don't, in the end, take power ourselves. If you look at people today who do believe in something, it's, they're mocked. They're really mocked. Religious people are the most obvious example, constantly mocked. I mean, OK, they haven't done themselves any favours. But I had to make that joke, didn't I? Because I had to say, oh, well, religious people, I mean, don't get me wrong, I'm not religious. I had to do that. So I think if you look at um, 
the way in which kind of people who say something slightly contrary to the grain are constantly now called phobic, they're homophobic or Islamophobic. And that doesn't ever really engage with their ideas. It just sort of says believing in something, thinking something, that's a little bit odd and you've got to stop. So what is needed? Well, I think we have to remember what we're doing is talking about ourselves. Eff effectively, it means we do not trust ourselves. We do not trust our judgments. We have to begin to do that to take a few risks and go out on a limb and perhaps say something stupid. We need to put down the shield that Jacob started to talk about at the beginning and block out that inner voice. We need to stop listening to voices. Finally, I think what we need to do is take a few things at face value and not ever listen to that other voice again for a little while. Thank you. Thank you very much. So as, as you can imagine, putting together a panel like this, there's obviously loads of things that I'd like to ask our panel about. But I think we're, A, going to be stretched for time, and B, it's probably, your things are probably going to be much more interesting than whatever I've got to say. Everyone on the panel so far has basically defined irony as the opposite of uh, seriousness. And I sort of wonder if you can really make a distinction like that, because um, you mentioned at the start about how the idea of the hipster mentality, about wearing things mm. ironically... And I would argue that um, there is actually a great deal of seriousness behind that mentality. It's a serious attempt to craft a particular image. So I'd basically say, um, I'm just, I would just uh, um, take issue with the notion that irony is the opposite of seriousness. I think that sometimes people can be ironic and be pretty serious about it as well. A brief question, really. Uh, just uh, think about uh, Edward's um, point uh, about uh, these ideas receding. Um, I think you're right, I think they are, but one of the questions that I'm quite interested in and, and looking at at the moment is, are they being replaced with anything? If, if so, by what? I'm interested in, the, um, in Tiffany's uh, voice, the other voice, because I think it's a really interesting um, way of thinking about this, because I think often the other voice, that voice that um, is the sort of running commentary on everything we do, that kind of evaluates us after we've done something, is connected to this idea of the voice of the excluded. And I think uh, earlier on the point was made that we are hypersensitive now to this idea of exclusion, that somehow what we're doing um, is not reaching someone else, this idea of the other, the outsider, the excluded and marginalized. We can never kind of pin it down or put our finger on it, but there's a terrible sense of guilt always attached to it. And I think that um, it's, it's really just an observation, but I do think that in a, in a way of trying to sort of um, conceptualize the position that we're in, on the one hand, ultra ironic, we don't care and it's all just playful, but utterly anxious and serious and concerned about um, you know, our moral behavior, and yet with no moral compass to guide us. And I think that the sort of paralysis is linked to that, and the paralysis is that whatever we do, this little voice will say, you didn't get that right, you missed somebody out, you have excluded someone. Um, it's a kind of undermining of action and, uh, and leading to paralysis. It sounds to me like you're, in a way, conflating critical thinking and a healthy scepticism, which has been a very important part of you know, intellectual progress since the Enlightenment, really, with, with sort of banality and an inability to commit to anything. And I just wonder where you would draw that line, really. I've got a co comment on the sort of the, the counter to irony. Um, Tiffany uh, spoke about hope, but I would want to talk about tragedy, if you like, as the uh, as the complement, uh, as a, as a counter, but also a, a complement. Because Julian spoke at the, the the beginning about that mismatch between our ideals and uh, uh, reality, our, our sort of sublime nature and our our. our um, a frail or trivial nature. And I suppose the, the, the embodiment of that would, would be Hamlet um, in, in terms of that recognition of that mismatch between our ideals and our, our, and our um, human failings. And I, I've been really struck in, in how there's been a recent resurgence of interest in serious tragedy because tragedy itself has become very much trivialised over recent decades, but it's really striking how there is a, is a serious demand for serious 
tragedy and how you have um, people seeking out through initiatives like the sort of National Theatre Live. It's, it's completely sold out, it's packed out. People are demanding seriousness. But, but in a, a recognising another voice, but the seriousness of, of um, conflicting values and, and a desire for judgments and commitments and a, a sense both of our ironic nature but, but also of our sublime uh, a serious nature. Yeah, well, I mean, the, the first question was saying that you know, irony has been defined as the opposite of seriousness. Well, not, not by me, I don't think. I mean, the point about seriousness is it's not something that is like binary and either or, or is like maximal or minimal. It's about the right amount and right kind of seriousness. And that's what I think is the problem. A lot of people descend into the bad forms of irony because they, they see that there are ways in which we take ourselves too seriously, etc., and therefore conclude we shouldn't take ourselves seriously at all. That's just being too kind of either or about the role of seriousness. But I mean, picking up on what Tiffany says and, and what some of the comments have said here, you know, I think this voice, this second voice, which questions what we believe and, and asks whether we're right, is vitally important. Of course it is. And I think if you don't have that voice, you do end up in the situation of like the characters in La Chinoise, where you end up sort of following down a road sort of blindly and you know end up perhaps doing terrible things and making mistakes it is important to think that we can't trust ourselves completely now again this is a bit like the whole seriousness problem the, qu the point is not whether we can trust ourselves and therefore you know have the courage of our convictions and move forward uh with, with certainty or whether we should just not trust ourselves at all it's rather we need to be somewhat mistrustful of ourselves of course we should we all of us have biases uh, preferences, uh, distortions, and so forth. So we do need that constant monitoring. And I think the real, the real problem is, and, and, and part of the discussion itself has got the problem, and the culture's a problem, is that, I don't know, we seem to find it always very difficult to deal with things that require this delicate balancing. We'd always rather flip over to, you know, the, the thing of, like, just have the courage of your convictions, just be committed or, you know, not, don't believe in anything, nihilism or idealism. Um, the middle ground between nihilism and idealism, I think, is a kind of a, an attempt to be serious about life and our projects with the appropriate degree of irony, which is a constant little reminder to ourselves to be aware you are, at the end of the day, one individual with all sorts of flaws <coughs> and limitations. And if you're not aware of them, then I think that's uh, extremely dangerous as as dangerous, if not more so, than sort of descending into that sort of nihilistic conservatism. The question about the uh, serious, uh, the opposition, false opposition, I think that's right, in a way. I mean, it's a trap of the language, you, you know, you constantly make that. I mean, for example, Julian kind of used the phrase, a uh, humorous idealism, and we kind of, you know, we know what he means. But, yeah, literally speaking, it's not really the issue, in a way. I mean, I would say literalism is the problem, rather than seriousness, I mean, in a way. But in certain contexts, maybe seriousness is the problem. So, you kind of, it's 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 not a straightforward thing, but language we have to realise is you know we're using the least inadequate words to describe pretty something that's pretty hard to get at. But irony is always serious. That's the point about it. It is not a joke. Uh, it is actually serious. It disguises itself as a joke in a way, but it is actually very serious. It has this very serious intent, which is really evasion uh, of seriousness, of sincerity. Possibly is an even better word. It always needs to be read at different layers and different levels. So you can actually understand an ironic person maybe totally, completely, and get them in a very, get, their, get to their sincerity if you understand them. And if you already are familiar with their art or their personality or whatever it might be. But it's not guaranteed. So that's kind of the problem. Uh, the question in the back about scepticism, I think that's right. And for the same reason, you know, scepticism, it's, of course we need scepticism, of course we need critical thinking, but irony is not that. Irony is an attempt to evade having to actually declare yourself. Uh, and a skeptic always declares himself, you know, so there's not an issue there. I just want to, this question of, I think, anorexia. I, I wrote here, irony is a kind of insulation against the imposed meaningless of excessive knowingness. So in the modern culture, we know everything, or we have it taken out a mortgage on all of our future knowledge. Even things we don't know, culturally, popularly, we kind of assume we know them. You know, that the brain will actually be demolished, that the idea that the, the self will be demolished. We kind of assume that's already factored in ideologically into our culture, even though the scientists haven't got there yet. They've told us they might get there. Most of them have taken a view on it, that we will get there, we won't get there. We kind of go with the view that they will. At, we're kind of only waiting for them to announce it in the, in the, the Guardian one day. And 
Irony is an attempt to avoid the great questions for fear an attempt to put words in your answers might result in your embarrassment or even banishment. It's a way of creating deniability. It greases the wheels of modern freedom thinking, consumerism, etc., protecting against the disappointment that arises as the inevitable outcome of seeking satisfaction where it's not available. So, you know, you kind of you kind of expect everything. You expect the disappointment. You expect so everything. It's it's like and it's at an early stage. I mean, I think that we will all in the future. Our great grandchildren will be extraordinarily unless things something fundamental change, like Jesus comes back or something. If he ever came in the first place, I have to say that as well because you know somebody might say I'm I'm talking about imaginary friends or something. You know, so I have to be very careful, ironically, about how I present myself so that you don't pin me down. That's vital. Don't pin me down. I, I, yeah, Ed. Um, uh, just the three things, and specifically on that one, I I'm not saying irony is not serious either. Very quick example, if you want to see irony working very seriously and very brilliantly, uh, some of you may know Carol Armitage. She's a choreographer, and she wrote a great uh, dance piece called Drastic Classism. You can see it on YouTube. It's brilliant. And the reason it's brilliant is everybody dances in a different style. There's ballet, hip-hop, rumba, um, Arabic dancing, all kinds of different dancing, but it's all very carefully choreographed. And the experience of watching that, especially live, is that you suddenly see the relationships between the different forms of dance and you see why the ballet moves are so difficult and why the hip hop moves are difficult and why some dancing is actually very easy and why some dancing is getting a lot more credit than it deserves. But essentially, by offsetting all these different forms of dancing on one stage, she makes some very, very serious and brilliant, I think, artistic points. So she's using irony seriously, seriously. So I don't think they're opposites at all. Second thing, if so, by what? I do believe that, uh, what I said in my talk, that irony and postmodernism are retreating in the mix. And I do believe that they're being used now like we use everything. I'm saying, you know, I'm a little bit medieval, I'm a little bit romantic, I'm a little bit enlightenment, I'm even a little bit Christian. Um, and certainly a little bit Greek. And all of those things inform the way I think. And I do think that postmodernism and irony are dropping a bit in the mix. And the reason I think that is because if you look around at culture, you ask me what's replacing it, what's cool, what's cool, which is a question we've not addressed, what's cool is doing stuff. And what's cool is actually playing stuff. So if you're in a band now, as my brother is, he's cool because he can play. It's not cool that he can sing on a X Factor, but that's not really cool anymore. What's cool is doing stuff. And so if you produce food in an organic farm and you bring it to London, those menus aren't ironic. They're saying, this is real and specific. And no, no one's joking. This is a real organic chicken. No one's thinking, oh, he does organic chicken. It's real, it's cool. It's asking for you to say that's, that's great. And we do say that's great. Um, if you look at our TV series like The Wire or Breaking Bad, that, that's, a, that's aiming for something that's real now. It's not like... 15 or 20 years ago, Black Adder, which is very popular, which is essentially ironizing various forms. Of it. We're moving away from it. It's dropping in the mix. It's cool to be real. That's the second point. Third thing about Hamlet, a related point. I agree with you. I think uh, high seriousness is, is, is sneaking back in the back door. And I think that it's good news that it is. I also think another point no one's made is that it's economic. I think after the collapse of 2007, 2008, um, there was, in a sense, a, a rebirth of people actually having to do and think and be real because basically we're all skint because of those awful people in the city. I was going to use a swear word, I won't. So I think irony and postmodernism are retreating because of also the economics. So I'd end by saying it's not cool to be ironic anymore. It's cool to be able to actually do something. Well, I think for the real to become genuinely real, we have to move away from an ironic culture, and I don't think we're going to. Um, I think if you, if you take the example of Hamlet or the kind of thirst for seriousness, which I don't doubt in any way, unless you have a culture which values Hamlet very early on and systematically through its institutions, it would just be something that we dip into and dip out. And you say you may have you know, a bit of medieval here and a bit of Victorian here, but unless you've really engaged with those and they've been valued for their own sake, then you're actually just kind of surfing it. 
I think. It's just the kind of, it's a riff, it's sampling, it's like a tune from the 90s that have sampled it very well but have never really got down to it and committed to it. I think unless you kind of give up irony, you won't be able to shape that real culture that we want. And how do we do that? Well, somebody talked about exclusion earlier on, and one of the phrases that was very popular recently in the media amongst middle-class white female journalists was check your privilege. Basically, check your privilege because you're white female and middle class, and you don't really know what you're talking about. And this, this came very much from that constituency of people. So immediately, anybody ever kind of tries to say something and be committed to something, even if they're serious about it, they have to check it and question it and query it. And I think unless we avoid doing that, the seriousness that may be desired and the real that people may want will never kind of catch. It won't have any traction. I think, this, I think that I'm making a different point, though. I think that if you make something now, if you, if you can actually shoot a TV series as opposed to just being a Trustafarian sitting around writing one, um, if you can actually make a flute, um, there's a friend of mine who makes beautiful flutes, if you can actually paint, I'm, I'm seeing a change in that those people which, I don't know, in the late 90s would not be looked up to, would not be thought of as cool, are now being thought of as cool again. And that's a different thing, the pride in making and the pride in uh, specificity and saying, well, I wrote that, I'm, I played that, I made it. Um, that's a very different thing to sort of saying, ironically, hey, anyone could have done that. Hey, I've sampled it. I think that is a change, personally. Yeah. I'll just let... Uh, yeah, well, we'll, we'll, just, we'll just get another, another attempt at this kind of thing to sort of stick up for this second voice. Because, I mean, I write about philosophy, and I think if you're going to do serious philosophy, if you're going to do really serious philosophy, I think you need to constantly have that awareness in the back of your head that you might be talking bullshit, you might be spinning in the wind. Unless you are aware that you are constantly running that risk in everything you do, I think you can't really do serious, proper philosophies. I actually, you know, I really do want to stick up for this questioning voice. It is not the death of commitment and the death of seriousness. It is rather a requirement for being committed and serious in ways which are ultimately going to be hopefully better. And then quickly, John. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I, I think because you can see something, irony, uh, predominantly as an attraction to something that's kind of culturally despised, but it actually more often is the opposite. It's a kind of neurotic attraction, a, a love or a secret desire for something which is unfashionable. And you, you want to redeem this by, and, and, and there's a kind of a conspiracy that's entered into then in order to redeem it ironically and then it, but, but people usually it's because it's good but it had become unfashionable like Tom Jones would be a good example he was a good singer but he just kind of had become naff because of the, the medallion or something the hairy chest and 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 so you couldn't say you liked him but in fact he was a great singer so it's actually not a, it's not cynicism irony is not cynicism I think sometimes you can kind of conflate the two and I think there's a kind of this metaphysical thing isn't it? irony is ultimately the way we live our lives lives that are unknowable as to their purpose or destination. We suspect that we're the butts of some cosmic joke, but we must go on anyway, having no realistic choice. So we kind of make up an end in a kind of a, an uncommitted, non-committed way. We kind of imagine all kinds of stuff. Uh, like postmodern is really that. It's kind of going to the, the destination, uh, putting that kind of bookend in at the end so that you can kind of work towards it. But actually, it, it, there's nothing there, really. It's an illusion. That okay. You're yeah, okay, so some more hands. I would, again, disagree with the fact that the irony is dying because actually it can be used for two functions. It can be used to make fun of something, which, as you say, is something we like to do a lot. We like to make fun of politicians because they are so serious, um, because, as you say, they can't really afford to be ironic. But then again, actually, they can also enhance the seriousness. There, there was a film produced in 1990 by a man called René who, used, who made quite an ironical documentary of the Holocaust. It was juxtaposed some really serious or horrific images with some ironic descriptions of Nazi home life and actually by saying oh it's really tough for those um, commandant wives they had to um, they were getting really bored with the war that was a better way of actually comparing their situation and saying oh it was all right for them because that is a very one-dimensional statement so I think irony can be used to me to make something more serious than it um, not than it is but to actually remind people that they are getting too flippant so I would say it's not one purpose, it has two functions. There's another sort of humour that um, you may have suffered, which is sort of male pub humour, which is, and what we do is we, gather, we just attack each other in order, and these are veiled attacks, and it is a way of negotiating the sort of pecking order, but you say that I'm only joking, and you get away with it. And I think in defence of irony, I think this works in a similar sort of way. I can have discussions with people 
who may not agree with anything I believe in, and I'm, and I'm not exactly sure what they believe in, but we can have a friendly talk. But if I push it with a midget joke, if it goes a bit too far, and I sense that I've upset them, I pretend that I was only joking. And they're generous enough to pretend that they believe me. Mm. And, I think, <laughs> and I think this can work actually internationally in ways. It's exploring how far I can get. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I was wondering if anybody had any opinions on irony and consumerism. Because I think... Uh, what John was saying about how irony relates to sort of our impoverished sense of self, it's hard in our generation to have a sort of sense of self which is um, separate from stuff, the stuff that we have, we're constantly being told to have that our, that our identity is um, about what we consume. Um, and because of that, I, I wonder how far we can actually have a sense of authenticity and the real when we're still getting the same messages to buy things and that authenticity in the real is just another way of getting us to consume things. First of all, I'd like to uh, propose an alternative kind of counter uh, to irony. I'd say that tragedy doesn't work and, um, for example, let's take a tragedy. Uh, the mass shootings that have taken place this year and over the past years in America uh, I think because just the pace of knowledge consumption dictated by the internet nowadays means we can't actually digest uh, that sort of thing. Uh, and now I bring up the internet. Um, uh, if, if we have this kind of opposition of state and seriousness, which goes, we are not amused, and that's how it treats things, then on the other hand, you've got the internet and irony going, we are amused, and that's how they treat things. I, what I would actually propose as a solution to irony would be quirks. These are stamps of authenticity uh, and they give a very obvious and because it's obvious, it, like it's the obvious joke to make, so if you're ironic about it, it's not very, it's not the sort of thing that people kind of laugh at, because uh, it's so obvious. I just want to tell you a story really. I was teaching some undergraduates and an 18 year old girl, my theme was critical thinking, and an 18 year old girl said, um, the thing she hated most at universities were lecturers who went on and on about critical thinking. Because they never actually said anything. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and if you look at universities, I have to make a connection here between that sort of cynicism, which is what it is, and irony. Because in universities, it's hard to get anybody to take their ideas and beliefs seriously. Mm -hmm. That's an institution where you should take them seriously. And I think it's true about Ju uh, Julian's middle way is a way of avoiding anything. Every university lecturer used to say, look at both sides of the argument. Now, that's all they ever do. They never take one side of the argument. I think that's an example of something that's happening. The ability to take yourself seriously as human beings. It's also true of the move to the practical. I was reminded of, of Candide, where they drop philosophizing at the end and go and work in the garden. You know, that's abandonment of ideas. And I think that's the real trouble we face, that nobody takes themselves seriously and puts forward ideas in a, an unironic way. And just, I did agree with Julian that um, you know, Debate is the future, right? It is an unironic statement. As Claire said in her opening um, remarks, there's nothing going to follow from this because debate is what we need. And debate means, as somebody said to me once, you don't mean debate in that old-fashioned sense where one person puts one point of view and another person puts another and they argue about which is true. And I said, yes, I do mean debate in that sort. And that's what we should get to rather than playfulness. And it's easy to get laughs by being playful, but that's another way of just avoiding taking yourself seriously. Yeah, I just wanted to also make a note about the tragedy and uh, I'm curious about this relationship between irony and tragedy because it seems that uh, in the end uh, people are uh, in, in able to experience tragedy anymore and what does this, what, because they are trying to avoid it with being ironic, let's say, and what does that say about yeah, ability of people to do anything truly. I mean, if, if this is something that's been cancelled as an option. Okay, cheers. So thanks very much for those. We're now going to just get some final sort of remarks, a lot sort of like take on point from each of our panellists. So, okay, first of all, right kind of middle way is not about, I agree, it's not about there are two sides to the debate and just sort of don't commit yourself. It's about finding the appropriate uh, 
taking the balanced position, which may or may not be, and often isn't, equidistant between the two opposite points. But the, the more substantive point I wanted to make was, you know, what comes afterwards? I have great faith in the, in the re-imposition of reality. I think what has happened is that now, with the great outflow of, of communications and the internet and all this kind of stuff, uh, over the course of the last hundred years, the sort of powers of persuasion and dissembling, etc., have become very, very complicated, marketing and everything. But now, actually, it's got to the stage where everyone can see behind all that. And so if you take a brand, a brand can actually can no longer be sustainable in the long run by very clever kind of marketing, which is all about appearances, because that gets found out. People know what the marketing tricks are and so forth. The only way to sustain stuff in the future will be by, by making good stuff, which works. And the same thing, I think, hopefully happen for ideas. So I think the, the real um, reimposes itself now, and I think that's something which is, is a cause of hope. Brilliant, thanks. That was exactly a minute. Well done. Um, so, uh, Ed, Ed, next, please. I'll say simply that I think irony is really a disguise for postmodernism, and I think postmodernism was a wonderful and very serious and brilliant idea, but I think that it's not or no longer the only idea, and I think that uh, three or four things are reasserting themselves, specificity, authenticism, um, reality, and uh, economics. Okay, cheers. John. Yeah, uh, the, the, the question about the, the consumerism, I think, gets to the core of it, because actually what, like that process I described of, of our, our self being hollowed out and being replaced by this kind of Michelin man reality self out in the public sphere, which is created in, to consumerism, or we built it, we build it, we help to build it, and the society, the culture builds it with us. But it's never us. We never feel that it's authentically us. So that's why we have to be ironic about that. We buy things into it, we buy clothes. Into it. Like I've got my Johnny Cash look today, but I'm not Johnny Cash, and I, I don't want to but I'm a bit ironic about being maybe mis mistaken that the man in black but it's still so you kind of construct yourself in a, in a certain way but you have an irony about it because it allows you to be comprehended in a crude way but it's not you because yourself your, yourself is in there and it's getting smaller and smaller and smaller and that's the thing but you see the other side of that is I want to just quote C.S. Lewis because this is really important. This is, he talked about seeing through things, which is kind of the ironic way of thing, doing things. And he said, you can't go on seeing through things forever. The whole point of seeing through something is to see something through it. It is good that the window should be transparent because the street or garden beyond it is opaque. How if you saw through the garden too? It's no good trying to see through first principles. If you see through everything, then everything is transparent. But a wholly transparent world is an invisible world. See, to see through things, to all things, is the same as not to see. Thank you. Brilliant. Cheers. Um, everyone. And Tiffany. There's been a couple of comments in the audience that have um, bemoaned the media and consumption. And I'm ambivalent about both. I kind of think we um, get the media and the, the realm of the consumer that we deserve. It's, we, we've handed over that power, partly because we have detached ourselves from our lives, really, from taking responsibility for sustaining it culturally and for making some sort of political commitment. It's very hard to talk about these things without sounding sort of inflexible and dogmatic. But I think ultimately we are talking about our ability to trust ourselves to do something better. I don't think it is exploring how far you can get. I think it's assuming you're not going to get there and preventing yourselves from even thinking about where you might go were you to dream a little bit. The real is a product of our desire for something better, but our inability to commit to it. The only way the real will become real rather than real is if we are generally, genuinely engaged with it and do more than just the I and do more than just I like this, I consume this. You have to, I think, speak for other people. Um, you have to stop checking your privilege and start saying what you think openly and honestly. Okay, brilliant. Can we thank all our panellists, please?